I first learned about the sex trade when I was eight years old. Dancing around our living room, singing along to the movie Grease, you might remember these lyrics. You think you're such a looker, but no customer would go to you unless she was a hooker. To her everlasting credit, my mom took me aside and gently told me what the word hooker meant. I was mystified by this concept, and I couldn't wrap my head around it. Years later, studying art history in college, I became curious about the prostitutes depicted in 19th century French art. Who were they, and who was buying them? Through research, I came to understand that this system was built upon the premise that some people were expendable, and privileged people felt entitled to exploit them. Following graduation, I was doing curatorial work in Prague, and I began to see prostitutes in the streets at night. I noticed them outside clubs and near my apartment. These were not paintings, and this was not the past. These were real women and girls in front of me. They looked young and sometimes scared. I saw that this system of entitlement and exploitation was still very much a reality. A decade later, I went back to work in Prague, this time with my husband and son. Traveling to Germany one time, we drove through a grim border town that felt deeply sinister. We passed a row of shabby sex clubs, and although the clubs were eerily quiet at 7 a.m., there were still women out on the road. I noticed one girl in particular seated on a stone wall, putting on her makeup, and I sensed that she was not here by choice. In contrast to my four-year-old son, happily <laughs> chattering away in the back seat, I saw this person stripped of her freedom. I needed to know more about why she was there. Thus began my research, and what I found out changed me. Here is an example of what could have happened to this girl, who I will call Irina. From a poor country such as Bulgaria, Irina is approached by a female recruiter from a trafficking ring. Wearing flashy clothes and driving a Mercedes, this woman recruiter promises Irina work in Austria at a hotel in Vienna. In order to pay her sick mother's medical bills, Irina accepts. She joins four other girls who have been promised similar jobs, and they board a long bus ride to Vienna. But Instead, the bus stops in Belgrade, Serbia, where handlers are waiting to collect the girls, take away their passports, and to transport them to an apartment building on the city's outskirts. There, Irina is systematically broken down through extreme violence, rape, and degradation. One girl is especially resistant, and all of the girls are forced to watch as she is viciously gang-raped by five men. There are cameras filming this girl's agony because there is a market for videos like this in online porn. Once the girls are emotionally broken and compliant, they are instructed then how to dress, move, act, and sound during sex in order to be the most profitable product. Soon pimps come after about two weeks and they test drive the girls' bodies. That's what they call it. Afterwards, they are sold and moved to cities throughout Western Europe. Irina is taken to the Czech-German border, where her pimp controls her through threats to her mother back home, isolation, deprivation, and fear. Made to stand by the highway, even in winter, Irina sells herself to men in their cars and in makeshift huts nearby. She must give everything that she makes to her pimp, who rarely lets her out of his sight. This is sex trafficking, but it doesn't just include crossing borders or abduction, as in Irina's story. Sex trafficking is when a person is coerced into commercial sex for someone else's profit. Plain and simple, it is slavery. There are currently four and a half million women 
men and children, boys and girls, sold into commercial sex globally. For reference, this is the equivalent of the population of metropolitan Boston, including the suburbs. Sex trafficking is not just in Europe or in Southeast Asia. It is everywhere, happening all around us, including in each of our 50 states. Here's an example of how it could happen in Maine. A girl from northern Maine, let's call her Abby, was raped by her mother's boyfriend when she was nine. Abandoned and homeless by 15, Abby couch surfs from one friend's house to another. One day, she meets an older guy at the mall, and he tells her she's beautiful, buys her some presents, and starts pursuing her. Within a week, he says he's falling in love with her, and he invites her to move in with him down in Portland. Seeking someone, anyone, to value her, Abby is extremely vulnerable to his seductive grooming tactics. But soon he begins to beat her, and he insists that she start hooking up with his friends. Within a month, he has branded his name on the side of her neck, and she is locked in a motel with three other girls, forced to sell herself online for his profit. She must follow his rules and meet his quota of having sex with multiple men per day, or suffer severe beatings. Over time, Abby comes to believe what he and the other men who use her tell her, that this is all she is good for. I want to remind you that Abby is 15 years old. By the time she turns 18, she will have been raped likely thousands of times. I want you to take a moment to consider how you feel about Abby. Now I want you to take a moment to consider how you would feel if you actually knew her. Since discovering what is really going on in the commercial sex trade, I've transitioned from working as an art historian to working as an anti-sex trafficking advocate. I've developed awareness projects. <laughs> I've developed awareness projects through film and art, and I work to support vulnerable people through my involvement with the Knox County Homeless Coalition in Midcoast. So what can you do to help? First, I want you to understand how this happens. Pimps and traffickers who are modern-day slaveholders are uniquely skilled at targeting and manipulating vulnerable people, preying on victims of circumstance. In Maine, Sex trafficking victims are typically women between the ages of 14 and 30. Often they have experienced childhood sexual abuse, and many are struggling with low self-esteem, mental health, and addiction. Sometimes they are runaways or homeless, so the most direct thing you can do here in Maine is to support organizations that help the homeless. Mentor, donate, volunteer at a local homeless shelter, what may seem like a small action really can have a big impact in breaking cycles and changing lives. Next, we have talked about victims and traffickers, but addressing the sex buyers is critical. We live in a world in which entitled, privileged people feel entitled to purchase and abuse another human being for their own pleasure, someone whose life has gone desperately wrong. It is this demand that fuels sex trafficking, the kind of suffering and cruelty that I have shared with you. Please do not excuse it as the world's oldest profession. Finally, <laughs> finally, we must question and speak about the dehumanization, the steady stream of dehumanization depicted and abusive behavior and sexual violence depicted in music, TV, movies, and in mainstream internet porn. This easily accessible media <laughs> this easily accessible media is making us numb to the damaging impact that this behavior has on human beings. It is also creating a distorted view of sex and intimacy. 
We have the power to shape a kinder, more compassionate world. <laughs> Girls like Irina and Abby are human, and they deserve the same rights and freedoms and dignity that we all have. As you leave here this evening, I hope that you will remember these people, that you will talk about this injustice, that you will think about and talk about power imbalances in our culture, and that you will take action to help the vulnerable. Thank you.